When Anya and I got engaged, we wanted to make our own wedding rings. I thought, how hard could it be? It will probably take just a couple of hours. Here I stand two years later with an advertising spot for our jewelry shop. So how did we do it? Let's backtrack a bit. I studied metallurgy and gathered some work experience in automotive design, but settled for creating renders and animation for product marketing. You also might have seen this animation of mine. More on that in a minute. We knew from the very beginning that we didn't want a classic wedding ring, but preferred something personalized that fitted our styles. We started doing them with DIY YouTube videos where the texture is carved onto the surface. In the end, it was okay-ish, but we knew we could do better. So the plan was to first make a design and then try to recreate it. Here's one of my first attempts. Pretty cool, huh? I would like to say that it's based on long research into design theory, multiple sketches, and a week of sculpting. But it's not. It's a subdivided cylinder with a displacement modifier on top. I really love those quick and dirty workflows. I had a lot of fun experimenting and came up with a ton of new designs. The title of this talk is Brute Force Approach to Fine Jewelry Design. In cryptography, a brute force attack means breaking a password by trying all possible combinations. If you have a four-digit pin, you try all 10,000 numbers until you find the right one. We had a similar approach to our design process. Let's make as many as we can and see which one we feel connected to. It's one of the few decisions that last a lifetime, so let's make it count. It was during that time that I had a eureka moment. I made not only some pretty renders, but also a precise 3D model. Now I would have to find a way to produce it. I had some experience with resin 3D printing, so that was the first obvious step. The blue light you see comes from a LCD screen emitting UV light onto the liquid resin sitting above it. Wherever the light hits, it hardens the resin into plastic. That way, you get a physical model from a digital one. The resolution is absurd. 20 micrometers, and you even get anti-aliasing. It's also mega fast. You can print 40 rings in like three hours. After the print was done, we cleaned it and spray painted it gold. Then we could try the designs directly on our fingers. That way, we found the designs we would like to wear. Later, we called them gear and sunflower. But yeah, at that point, we had a wedding ring made of plastic. Now the task was to find a way to produce it in solid gold. While I studied metallurgy, I learned about the lost wax vacuum casting technique. It works by creating a casting mold based on a wax model. We already had the model. Now I had only to print it out in a special wax-like resin that melts during the burnout process. Fun fact, Sauron didn't forge the rings. He used a casting technique similar to what we do, <laughs> but we do it in vacuum to get rid of any bubbles. The result was definitely worth it. We got overwhelmingly positive feedback from anyone we showed our wedding bands to. And that sparked the idea to turn this DIY project uh, into a business. I knew that only continuing with the brute force approach would get us anywhere. So we made thousands of designs, and if it looked promising in the viewport, we would make a physical prototype. Now for a quick overview of how the current process looks like. Uh, it is based on our custom load of the rings add-on, and <laughs> the, the logic is actually the same that I showed before. Uh, base mesh solidify subdivide displacement boolean. We made heavy use of substance materials, 
As for my money, they are the best source of texturing in general. They are really high quality, and most of them are procedural, meaning they can be adjusted to fit your needs. Just a quick shout out to all the material artists. It's a good idea to normalize the displacement map before export, meaning the values go from zero to one. That way, you get a constant base mesh level, and the height can be given in millimeters. The textures can be manipulated by changing their position, rotation, scale. We have a few differently stretched UV maps that generate new designs. So experiment with the sliders until you find something that catches your eye, some final adjustments, and voila, you are a jewelry designer. We even had a preview of the final finish. So the interior surfaces will not be polished, but will remain in a casting rough surface. It was done by an ambient occlusion mask for a normal map. The design can be then saved in our um, add-on as CSV data for further use. The whole setup is 100% non-destructive meaning it can be adjusted to the size of your finger and the height can be changed. To do that, you have to scale the base geometry, but also the UV map at the same time, so the texture will not be stretched. It's a really cool feature that you can put anything as an attribute into geometry nodes and then do operations on it, like this UV map. You can also get flat side edges or curved interior surfaces and that requires parametric Boolean cutters. The 3D print is made based on STL files. So fill out what you need, and the topology with additional technical canals will be exported. Then you import that into Cheetobox. It's a free and intuitive 3D print preparation program. It adds the supports and slices the model into 20 micrometer horizontal layers. Now, the LCD screen knows what should be hardened and what not. The prototypes were crafted in silver, as it's 100 times cheaper than gold. To get the right look, it was electroplated with a half micrometer layer of real gold. And if the final piece looked amazing, it would be available for sale. But how do we showcase it and interest the client? I'm the marketing guy, remember? So the first thing you have to do is to show all the possibilities that are available. While we have about 90 rings physically made, there are hundreds of variants on the website. And each product needs a few different um, renders from in a few different scenes under a few different camera angles. If you multiply that, you will surely need a system to, uh, to do that. A feature that is rarely talked about but is really powerful are the view layers. You can think of them as an animation system for loading collections to the blend file. It's pretty basic in current version, but the nice thing is you can always extend the functionality by writing an add-on. So adding a sorting of the view layers or the option to add a collection that is only visible in the current view layer. Our workflow looks as follows. Every single view layer is a separate photo shoot scene. You don't have to worry about the file getting too large and being not responsive. Closed collections don't even get loaded from the drive. The camera, HDRI, and the view layer are linked together, and then you add the camera to the list and render all of them in a batch. So the settings will be the correct ones in, in that different scene. We connected that add-on with the previous one, so we were able to render thousands of designs uh, it becomes really powerful when you connect geometry nodes to Python scripting. And I even set a naming convention for the um, render images, so it can be uploaded in batch in a CSV file format directly to our online shop, so no errors can be made. 
When you have the final um, render, you can post-process it uh, with this add-on. It loads the whole folder, does the same operation on it on each of the renders, and saves it. So it's really useful when you have to adjust new renders to something that is already available in the shop. We even did um, an advertising spot for our jewelry shop based on some basic um, Blender functionality. So this rock was modeled using a displacement modifier guided by weight paint. Basic fluid simulation, but the texture is camera projected and then animated in the z-axis to match the movement, so the mapping of it. Light linking setup. It's not physically correct, but gets the required effect. Collision and cloth simulation. The baked simulation has a um, texture with an alpha channel on it and um, some cubes scattered on top. Displacement of a 4D procedural texture. Sculpting with a cloth sim brush and then assigning it to two different shape keys, before, after. It becomes really useful because you can then adjust it in post, in real time. So the strength, the timings, or combine it with different shape keys. Rigid body simulation and um, force field and collision with an invisible object. It's a combination of two different simulation node tutorials. It's really awesome that you can just chain those node groups together and they just work, giving you a really complex result. So everything was set and we went to our first wedding fair and received uh, very positive feedback, but most importantly, we got our first orders. Let me share a story with you. A client came to us with a special request. She wanted to surprise her husband by um, changing their old wedding rings for new ones. So based on a traced outline of the old ring, we chose the fitting size and the surprise worked perfectly. It just fit. It's really fulfilling to create something from nothing, something that is symbolic and people will wear their whole lives. If it were a TED talk, now would be the right time for a motivational speech. But it's not. So let me tell you about the other side of the project. The surface quality was a nightmare. You get cavities, porosity, and a whole list of weird stuff. You cannot salvage it. You have to start over from the beginning and until you get to the Goldilocks zone. Also, don't inhale the 3D resin fumes. <laughs> they are toxic and carcinogenic. But now for the really ugly stuff. I showed you the basic modifier setup and then the clean load of the rings add-on. But this is development stage. It looks like this because Blender has a lot of procedural tools for modeling and everything can be animated. That means that every single frame can represent a different design. Then I set the frame range and rendered hundreds of variants. So, why didn't I do it with geometry nodes and Python scripting from the beginning? Because I didn't know what I was doing, nor what I wanted to achieve. I just did stuff. And that's OK. I strongly believe that premature optimization is the root of all evil. At the beginning of the project, you know the least about what you want to achieve. As you do it, you learn stuff, you change things, and you go forward. Give yourself the space to fail, as it's the only way to make progress. Until this point, I talked to you about jewelry, but this kind of brute force approach is pretty useful when it comes to a few different scenarios. So we were, while we were doing the project, I was also running a small 3D studio. We were doing renders and animation for product marketing. One of the projects involved rendering all 150 bathtubs of our client. So first, we had to model them based on some rough cut data. 
So I made a modifier stack based on minimal geometry, 36 vertex to be exact, and then uh, could model every single variant based on that and get a really clean topology and ideal shading and reflections. Then we had to light it. Let's start with a brute force approach. When you have a folder with a ton of HDRIs but you don't know which one to use, you render all of them. This add-on loads the whole folder, rotates them a few times along the z-axis, and gives you the output. That way, you have a starting point that you can then further adjust with additional highlights until you have the final setup. But the starting point is really important. Uh, when you have to render a few different objects in the same scene, you can keyframe the index switch. Then you, can, you have a setup that you can copy in between uh, scenes or files, and it's really useful to reuse. After the bathtubs, we also did um, furniture and showers, and we delivered thousands of designs in just a few months. There is an additional advantage to this procedural automatic um, brute force approach. Every client wants just the last small final change. Now it's super easy, barely an inconvenience. You do the change, render through the night, and deliver in the morning. Done. I have a hot take for you. Blender isn't the best 3D software. It is the best software, period. <laughs> I talked to you about industrial design and batch photo editing, but it can do complex kinematic calculations like it's nothing. This model wasn't rigged, but I approached it like I would in a CAD program. I added a constraint on each hinge and then run a rigid body simulation. It's possible because it's based on a real-world machine. I will provide a link to the file if you want to take a closer look at the end. Blender is pretty popular when it comes to ArcVis, but it can also do the next step, 2D technical drawings. I hijacked the Z-axis for a layer system and render out the viewport. But can it run Doom? <laughs> yes. Yes, it can. This guy, Sando, he did it with 15 lines of code and simulation nodes. Geometry nodes are Turing complete. That means that, in theory, they can do absolutely anything. I even prepared this presentation in Blender. <laughs> this add-on is based on the video sequence editor and uh, it converts the meta strips into slides and also adds a full screen presentation view. It's really useful when you have a ton of video materials and have to get the timings right, like for client demos or teaching. This conference is a reminder that Blender is an ecosystem. It gives you the space and the tools for you to create but it's up to you to choose how to use it. It's not workflow-oriented. Therefore, we have talks that range from simulating biological systems up to rendering atmospheres of exoplanets. The add-ons from this presentation can be downloaded from our website, and feel free to order something while you are there. <laughs> Thanks for having me.